We've recreated Charles II of Spain's portraits. Now let's recreate the unlucky wives who got to marry him. If you're new to my channel, welcome. Here on Mortal Faces, I transform historic portraits to see how individuals we read about might have looked in real life, as well as talk a little bit about them. So thank you for watching, subscribe for more historic recreations, and let me know in the comments who you want to see in real life. Marie-Louise d'Orléans was the eldest daughter to Philippe Duc d'Orléans, the brother to Louis XIV, and his first wife Henriette of England. She was born in 1662 in the Palais Royal in Paris. This used to be the official royal residence, but after Philippe married Henrietta, Louis XIV allowed him to use it as his residence. Charming, pretty, and graceful. Marie-Louise, who was her father's favorite child, had a happy childhood, residing most of her time in the Palais Royal. She spent a lot of her time with her paternal and maternal grandmothers, Anne of Austria and Henrietta Maria of France. She was everything you'd expect from a good royal daughter, likable, social, pretty, and got along with her family. Not only did that make her a very attractive wife-to-be, but also her family background made her as eligible as any princess. And so she became Charles II of Spain's fiancé, her first cousin, once removed. They were both the same age, 17, in July of 1679. But Marie-Louise, no, 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 she was upset, crying. Not because she had to make babies with him, but because she was in love with her first cousin, her uncle Louis XIV's son, the Dauphin of France and heir to the French throne. But of course, the deal was done. She had a proxy marriage and well wishes, and soon left France for Spain, never to return again. Remember, by this point, she only had these attractive portraits of Charles, and when she arrived in Spain, this turned to this. But she married him for real, and this was the start of a lonely existence at the Spanish court. The Spanish court was difficult. First, half of them didn't like the French, and secondly, she didn't speak the language. So she stayed close to the wife of the French ambassador. But you know how toxic people can be, so their relationship became more and more formal until the French ambassador and his wife had to leave for home. So she was now all alone. Her husband, Charles II, did love her. It was like Esmeralda marrying Quasimoto. His personality was there even if his appearance wasn't. He tried to make her happy, but with the continuous lack of pregnancies, it became hopeless, and she felt hopeless. They were married for 10 years, and nothing popped out. Eventually, she ate for emotional reasons, becoming overweight, and in February 1698, age 26, she was horseback riding, felt great abdominal pain, and vomited with convulsions. Turns out it was appendicitis. On her deathbed, she told her husband, Many women may be with his majesty, but none will love him more than I do. O oh, Charles, the 26-year-old widow, with everything wrong, was the only hope left for the continuation of the Spanish Habsburgs on the throne. So he quickly married his distant cousin, Maria Anne of Neuburg, daughter to the Elector Palatine the same year, despite his wishes to remain single. Her first impressions were quite imperious and hasty. Charles did not welcome his wife this time, rather waited for her to arrive from Germany. Maria Anna was definitely not Marie Louise, and immediately took charge and imposed her will upon her feeble husband. Despite being handpicked by the Queen Dowager, Maria Anna would prove to be the match of her mother-in-law. When contradicted, she would suffer from hysterical nervous crisis, and her new husband would continue to go into mortal fear of a provoking one. But you see, she was chosen for her family's reputation for fertility, and with their Wittelsbach connection of her sisters, Maria Sophia became Queen of Portugal, and Eleanor married her cousin Leopold Habsburg of the Austrian branch. Maria Anna's power derived from her status as mother to the future monarch, which dissipated when it became clear this was unlikely to occur. By now, Charles was almost certainly impotent, his autopsy later revealing he had only one atrophied testicle. So to offset this, she claimed to be pregnant on various occasions and encouraged Charles to undergo treatments to increase his fertility, thus making it clear the failure to produce an heir was not her fault. But on the ninth year of their marriage, Charles II got seriously ill. The Spanish court was divided between pro-French or pro-Austrian factions. Who would be the heir? Maria Anna was pro-Austrian and hoped her nephew would become Charles II's heir. However, Charles survived for two more years, and upon his death, the pro-French cardinal Porta Carrero 
persuaded him to alter his will for Louis XIV's grandson, Philip of Anjou. His death on the 1st of November was followed by Philip's proclamation as King of Spain on the 16th, with Porta Carrero as his chief advisor. Maria Anna was 33. For the rest of her life, she remained highly forgotten. The Duke of Anjou, now King Philip V of Spain, headed south immediately to take possession of his inheritance. Maria Anna was ordered to leave Madrid before the arrival of the new king. She headed for Toledo with a large pension of 400,000 ducats. The Austrians were not about to let Spain slip from their grasp, and the following war briefly made the Archduke Charles a victor, and so Maria Anna welcomed her nephew with open arms. However, Philip was soon in power again, and Maria Anna was arrested. She was shipped off to Bayonne in France, where she lived in retirement for nine years. She was allowed to return to Spain, where she would spend the next 26 years of her life at Guadalajara. She died on the 16th of July, 1740. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more videos. Each of your subscriptions does help this channel grow. It allows me to continue making more content for you. Let me know in the comments who you want to see next. I do make a list of all your suggestions, and I will see you in the next one.